face to face with a brave new world. Domestic servant or ruthless assassin, guardian angel or messenger of death. From the beginning, science fiction has explored a million futures for the robot. Today, they may be mere factory slaves, but that is all about to change. Already, a new generation of robots are waiting in the wings. Machines that can repair themselves, teach themselves, even breed and evolve. One day we may end up sharing the planet with machines that are not only stronger than us, but more intelligent. My last hurrah is going to be the building of a mobile, sensate, two-armed, articulate robot, something I think we can do by the year 2000. Joe Engelberger is the father of robotics. For 40 years, he's designed and built robots for the factory floor. This is his new baby, Helpmate, a hospital porter that delivers everything from soup to scalpels all on its own. He's planning his route. It's looking into the map and saying, how do I do this whole route that you want me to do, which goes to the library and so forth, and away it goes. If you wanted to buy a robot today, you couldn't get much more advanced than this. And Helpmate's got an impressive family tree. His great-grandfather was Unimate, the world's first industrial robot. In 1959, Unimate launched the robot age. Even then, Joe Engelberger knew his children would change our lives. Behind every act of that robot, there's human thought that prevailed. But one day, we expect robots to be controlled by a central computer. It'll tell each robot what it must do for the day, it'll monitor its work during the day, it'll shut them down at the end of the shift, start them up for the next shift, it'll measure the work throughout the day. And that's pretty well what happened. Joe Engelberger's robots did change our lives. They starred in commercials, they replaced millions of workers across the world. But while industrial robots are efficient, they are still unintelligent. And 30 years down the production line, they're a long way from the science fiction dream. A dream which began in the 1920s. All work will be done by living machines. The robots will clothe and feed us. R-U-R. Rossum's Universal Robots. An army of artificial servants created by Carol Chapek. Robota is the Czech word for slave labor. And so, the robot was born. It was Fritz Lang's masterpiece, Metropolis, that created the first cinematic image of the robot. Human in form, perhaps intelligent, alluring, and yet frightening. It's all turned out rather differently. So far, robots have remained glued to the factory floor. All brawn and no brain. So how close are scientists to building the robot of science fiction? The robots that can walk, talk, and hold things. Could they achieve in decades what's taken human evolution millions of years? Joe Engelberger's latest robots may have escaped the factory floor, but they're still essentially slaves. Helpmate can find its way around a hospital unaided, call a lift by remote control, get out on the right floor, and deliver food. Clever, as far as it goes, but hardly a Nobel Prize winner. Engelberger thinks his next robot will go further. The robot's going to cook, clean, fetch and carry, offer an arm, handle security. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and actually handle modest conversation. I am about to move. 
This is hardly the place for any kind of conversation. But who cares? You'd be speechless if you bumped into Engelberger's latest prototype. Scrubmate's job may be unglamorous, but don't let that fool you. There's some impressive technology attacking that lime scale. And if Scrubmate's clever, you should see what's lurking around the bend. In the future, robots will become our farmers, soldiers, builders, surgeons. They will clean our homes, clean our environment, and become our partners and agents in life. Rad Whitaker, robot builder extraordinaire. He designs robots that wouldn't be seen dead cleaning your toilet. Uh, my own robots, like this one from the Three Mile Island cleanup, have fixed up after accidents, work in construction. While we're sitting here, I have trucks with no operators in them driving in uh, commercial mines to haul materials. But I think we'll go far beyond that. I'm RB34. But how far should we trust our rapidly developing robotic friends? It's an important question, when they may soon have a mind of their own. Well, come on. I couldn't do that, sir. Are you refusing an order? Robots throughout the world, we command you to murder mankind. We left RUR murder in Act mankind. 1. By Act 4, the artificial workers had turned on their masters and destroyed mankind. This was pretty much how it was going to be. Even before the real robot was a twinkle in Joe Engelberger's eye, science fiction had condemned them as a menace. Don't touch me, you filthy robot! Surely, it didn't have to be that way. Enter science fiction legend Isaac Asimov, a man with a mission to rewrite the rules and resurrect the robot as our friend. I didn't want to write the usual robot story in which the main purpose of the robot was to destroy his creator. Destroy his creator. Destroy his creator. Asimov's books were a turning point. No matter how smart they got, his robots could never turn on us. That's because they were now controlled by one of the greatest laws of science fiction, a set of rules that still bear his name. Asimov's three laws of robotics. The first law is as follows. A robot may not harm a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. The uh, second law of robotics is that a robot must always obey a human being unless it's in conflict with the first law. In other words, a robot can't be ordered to kill a human being. And the third law of robotics is that a robot must never let itself come to harm. After all, it's an expensive piece of equipment. Uh, unless that violates rules one or two. Fire. Asimov's laws became the robot equivalent of the Ten Commandments, taken up by science and science fiction alike. In the 1950s film, The Forbidden Planet, the archetypal friend of humanity, Robbie the Robot, is put to the ultimate test. Pointed at the commander. Fire. You see, he's helpless. Locked in a sub-electronic dilemma between my direct orders and his basic inhibitions against harming rational beings. Cancelled. While Asimov's three the laws were saving the life of young Leslie Nielsen, they were also inspiring young scientists. Professor Marvin Minsky has dedicated his life to creating intelligent machines. Well, I admired Asimov very much because, uh, in my opinion, he was one of the best thinkers I ever met. So when we were beginning to develop some mechanical robots at MIT, I thought he might be interested to come and see one of the first slightly humanoid robots. And he was always too busy and uh, didn't. And finally I said, well, maybe you don't want to. And he said, that's exactly right. Here I'm writing about the robots of the future, and they're smarter than people and more graceful and dexterous. And I'm afraid that if I saw your primitive, clumsy, buggy machine, it would interfere with my imagination. You may think that this is a wild pipe dream, the idea of a robot housemaid. 
Well, it isn't. Dear me, you are a robot, aren't you? I've never seen one like this. And now, believe it or not, the floor is automatically clean, too. And in order to prove this, I've made this half-scale model. I'd like to make a thorough examination. It seemed impossible that the gap between fiction and reality would ever be closed. And you can see why. The problem is that it has to be able to do all kinds of jobs in an ordinary home. Oh, Mr. Ford, would you set the robot to clear the table? These may look like the smart robots that Asimov dreamed of. But move one bottle three inches to the left, and you'd be cleaning wine stains from the carpet by hand. In fact, it was only a few years ago that Asimov finally conceded that at last, robots were worthy of his vision. In 1989, the two giants of robotics met at Joe Engelberger's factory. He came up to the plant to see what we were up to and gave a lovely little talk in which he told the people, you know, when I started writing these robot stories, I did them to pay my tuition. Now I can sit back and watch you people turn into the real world the same things that I was dreaming about back then. And everyone was thrilled with his uh, graciousness. Asimov could afford to be gracious. His dream of intelligent, friendly robots was finally coming true. But the new breed of clever robots wouldn't exist but for one of the great unforeseen inventions of the 20th century. It all started exactly 50 years ago. Are people becoming obsolete? A giant electronic brain has started cogitating at the University of Pennsylvania. It's made of vacuum tubes, like your radio, and it can add up a column of figures a yard long in a second. It's the world's first electronic computer. Right now, it's solving mathematical problems for the U.S. Army, but who knows, someday a machine like this may check up on your income tax. ENIAC was a dim-witted giant that filled a large room, but had the computing power of a modern wristwatch. People saw a great future for this machine. The computer could only get bigger and bigger. In fact, the founder of IBM, Thomas Watson, made one of the biggest gaffes in scientific history when he predicted we'd only need five of them on the planet. Everyone thought big. There was one exception. In the same year as ENIAC, a work of fantasy hit the bookstands. In this far-fetched story, the logics, computers to you and me, are so small, there's one in every home. And that's not all. You know the logic setup. You got a logic in your house. It looks like a vision receiver used to. And you punch the keys for what you want to get. The logics are all connected to the tank, a big building connected to all the other tanks in creation. And everything you want to see or hear, you punch for it and you get it. Very convenient. Miniaturization, a computer in every home, and the internet. And all predicted in 1946. What about today's predictions? Within 50 years, there should be machines that are comparable in intelligence to the largest vertebrates, including human beings. After that, uh, they'll be moving into new territory and there will be super intelligent machines able to do things that nothing on earth can do today. Hans Moravec, computer scientist and robot guru. Current computers are approximately a factor of a million short of being able to match the processing power of the whole uh, human nervous system. But computers are evolving at the rate of a thousand fold every 15 years. Uh, and at that rate, uh, we only have approximately 30 years to catch up that factor of a million, uh, which means that uh, by about 2030, there should be computers capable of, of holding programs that can do the whole job of a human nervous system. Not that you'd believe it if you looked at his early work. Back in the 1970s, Moravec started what he thought would be a very simple task. He hit a problem. There were things that although they at first looked like they might be easier because human beings do them more easily, that in fact turned out to be heartbreakingly difficult. And those were things like looking at the world and seeing what objects there were in front of the camera that was connected to the computer and moving around competently in the world, you know, the, the typical robot tasks. Each flash here represents 15 minutes of computing time. Moravec and his colleague Red Whitaker have seen some dramatic changes since then. Ten years ago, 
uh, a driving machine uh, would uh, take an image, uh, think about that for maybe an hour uh, before making a step and a stop to take another image, and maybe hours to cross this room. Then in the course of maybe five or six short years, to go from that to walking, to running, to driving at highway speeds and uh, handling themselves in the open environment. In my world, that's pretty quick evolution. Take a look at it. This car thinks fast enough to drive itself at the speed limit, take corners, slow down for other traffic, and find its way across the United States, all on its own. Robots like these are as clever as they come, but they're designed to do one specific task. Robots that could do many things would probably look a bit more familiar. Very simple robots which have but a single function uh, don't look anything at all like uh, human beings. A vacuum cleaner which just sucks looks like a vacuum cleaner. However, if you want a robot to be as versatile as a man and yet live in our environment, then it would be nice to have him with the rough dimensions and shape and bending ability of a man because then he would find all the objects in the environment built for human beings would also be built for him. Limb by limb, scientists are finally piecing together the humanoid robot. Mechanical hands are already touch sensitive, with fingers as dexterous as ours. They can even do some things human hands can't. This astonishing robot is modeled on the walk of a turkey, but at the MIT's leg lab, they believe it could one day be a person. No one has gotten closer to reproducing the confident, upright motion that we take for granted. Compared to the human model, it will be faster, stronger, and with almost limitless stamina. And most significantly of all, we're giving robots the gift of sight. These remarkable robot eyes developed in Japan are trained to follow this moving light. Already, it can recognize its creator and keep him firmly in his sights. And this is just the beginning. Professor Takio Kanade, the man who knows more about robot eyes than anyone. My belief is that there will be a point at which robots will see far better than human can do. To me, that's obvious. For example, robots have infrared camera. Robots can have synthetic aperture radar. Robots can have a laser rangefinder. None of those are possessed by human. And if it all seems rather mechanical, meet the robot with a human face. She not only recognizes you, she can tell what mood you're in and smiles right back. The robot that puts you at your ease? Suddenly, we're very close to the original dream. After decades of inching forward, we're rapidly approaching the robot with the body of a super athlete. But strength is not enough. To be truly intelligent, it needs to think for itself. If science can achieve that, then our future really is fantastic. We are now entering one of the most exciting areas of science, where all the old rules are dissolving and anything seems possible. Robot evolution is taking off. The future could soon be out of our hands. In the film 2001, the star of the show was Hal, a super intelligent computer with a brain so complex it was almost human. So much so, it went mad. When Arthur C. Clarke wrote 2001, he thought that Hal would soon be a reality. Probably before the end of this century, we will be able to construct computers or artificial intelligences which can go out on their own and develop lines of thought irrespective of any programming and which may, in principle, be more intelligent than we are. Today, he's slightly less optimistic but can still see Hal on the horizon. Hal well, certainly isn't realistic for the year 2001, but he's totally realistic for the year 2101, if not before. 
One reason for Hal's late arrival is that unlike human beings, machines find it very difficult to understand the world around them. The common sense rules that we take for granted aren't necessarily something we're born with. We learn a great deal about the world as we grow up. Scientists have tried to program all that information into a computer, but perhaps there's a simpler way. I think the important thing is to get a very large collection of common sense knowledge into the thing, or else it won't be able to solve real world problems. One way to do that is to try to program it by hand, and that means sorting through millions and millions of little ideas and writing programs for them. The other is to make some sort of baby and have it learn. I just stopped to say hi. Many scientists agree. If you can design robots that learn like children, they'll grow up to achieve great things. Hi there, Xavier. How are you? Nice to see you again today. In my children's lifetime, we could have a situation where robots are more intelligent than humans. This would mean it's a robot world, not a human world. Robots are in command. Professor Kevin Warwick is Britain's leading prophet of the robot age. His tiny robots may only have the brain power of an insect, but everything they do, they've learned to do for themselves. They were built without even knowing how to move. But their special electronic brains, called neural nets, quickly worked it out. They can even learn to refuel. So robots can learn for themselves. And soon, they'll be teaching each other. One robot can learn from another robot in very much the same sort of way that one human learns from another. The robot is looking around its environment, investigating the environment by trial and error where another robot has already been there and done a certain thing, that robot can then tell the learning robot, this is what you do in that situation, or this is what you don't do. Same sort of thing as, as humans do. All over the world, these remarkable micro-robots are coming on in leaps and bounds. What's exciting scientists now is that, like human beings, they're going to pass their intelligence on to their children. They call it robot evolution. Robots can be taken in their present form and be evolved. Essentially, the best robots for any one generation, their characteristics can be taken, joined together, and modified to form better robots for the next generation. You do that over a number of generations, and you've got a much better robot. This is how it works. The red robot is told to chase the yellow one and the yellow one to get away. First generation, and neither of them know which way is up. One thousand generations later, and we've got a genuine game of cat and mouse. And what happens if you send a thousand generation robot after one with only two hundred generations under its belt? It's game over. This is the start of something very exciting, and it's not the science fiction writers talking now. These are the scientists at the cutting edge. And a robot evolution is going at blinding speed. The robots themselves, or the computers, are contributing to the speed of their own evolution. Success begets success, and the good ideas go into the next generation. Then we will have more intelligent computers, intelligent machines, designing themselves more machines. And as the machines become more intelligent, they will contribute more and more to their own evolution. It gets out of our control very quickly. Is anything beyond them? The human body is able to repair itself, even in the most delicate organ of all, the brain. Millions of neurons reroute messages to bypass damaged tissue. Surely machines will never be able to do that. Think again. If it's damaged, this computer from the Swiss Institute of Technology can repair itself unaided. It takes us another step closer to a virtually indestructible robot. We can look at a scenario where a robot loses part of its body, but can simply clip another part of its body in. If they have a problem that can be corrected, they're almost immortal. We'll be able to build robots that are as intelligent as humans and interact with us 
uh, as humans do and will become indistinguishable from humans. And I don't think this is going to happen in the very short term, but eventually down the line, I believe that that's what's going to happen. Professor Rod Brooks, the self-styled bad boy of robotics. He wants to build the ultimate humanoid robot. I just want to build the coolest robot around, and uh, what could be more, what could be better than a robot that can, that is like a, a human, a humanoid? That's been the dream of science fiction writers for a long time. Cog is a very complex robot. It has a head which is uh, with eyes on it. It's got uh, actually two cameras in each eye, so so that it can see a wide field of view and a very narrow field of view such as we do. Right now it only has one arm but it will soon have a second arm. Uh, it's an arm that we can interact with unlike a conventional robot arm. It's, it's rather springy and compliant. It's got lots of sensors and it needs those to be able to interact with people and do the sorts of things that humans can do in the world. And we're trying to have the system learn all those things as humans learn them so that the, it has the sorts of performance that a human has. And guess where he got his idea from? When I was a teenager, the, the movie 2001 came out. In the movie, Cog, um, sorry, Hal was turned on at, uh, on January 12, 1992. And that date came by and I realized we didn't have a Hal or anything like that on the horizon. In fact, I had a, a zeroth birthday party for Hal at my house and all my students came. We had cake and champagne. And then I got to thinking, well, maybe I should try and make Hal. And that was really the inspiration for Cog. At the moment, COG incorporates all the best robot technology from around the world. As new advances emerge, COG will absorb them. The idea is, he'll never stop growing. One day in the future, robots may see COG as their distant ancestor. But where will it end? In the Terminator films, our future is dominated by killer robots. Not much sign of Asimov's three laws here. Surviving humans wage a desperate war against the machines they have created. If the robots we create do become more powerful and more intelligent than us, the fundamental question is, will they act for good or evil? A lot of people are afraid of the idea of, of robots taking over the world and moving around in the world and being something different. And I think this is part of the long history of humans having to give up their center of the universe. Uh, could it not be that a machine, having grown more intelligent than man, could also become more ethical, can also become gooder? Could he not take measures to ensure man's well-being, not because we command him to, but because he wants to? Originally, uh, we had to give up the notion that the Earth was the center of the universe. Uh, more recently, with Darwin, we had to give up the idea that we were fundamentally different from animals. Now, as we're starting to look at intelligent robots, we, we have to give up the idea that maybe we're the supreme intelligence here on Earth, and we may end up happier. Gooder. Taking over the world. And... The visionaries may be right after all. One day in the not-so-distant future, robots will take their place alongside us. Ultimately, they may see us as weaker and less intelligent. When that happens, we can only hope they look kindly on their creators and that we find a way to live together and share our fantastic future. Next week on Future Fantastic, adventures in space and time. We reveal how mankind will conquer the universe and bring you the breakthrough that could at last make time travel a reality.